Sisters, we live at a time that the Lord Jesus Christ knew was going to be very dangerous for the final generation of Christadelphians. He made that very clear in Revelation chapter 16. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with this passage, but would you just join me there for a, a couple of minutes as we look at Revelation chapter 16. We know that this is the period from verse 12 to verse 16 of the sixth vial of the wrath of God. And we know that we are very late in the day of the sixth vial because it began in 1820 with the beginning of the process of drying up the great river Euphrates. It was uh, marked by a very significant turn of events. The second great earthquake of the apocalypse produced three unclean spirits like frogs, we read in verse 13. And these unclean spirits like frogs are of course are the emanation of the French Revolution. That's why the frog is used in this passage. And then we see the dramatic work that they're going to do in verse 14, to which we will return shortly. One thing is very clear though, the words of verses 12 to 14 inclusive are written by John, the Apostle. And so is verse 16, but not verse 15. Verse 15 is actually in parenthesis in the Greek text because it's almost as though Christ snatches the pen from John's hand and writes a special message to just one or two generations of Christadelphians. And he particularly has in mind the final generation that will be there when he arrives in the earth. And he says there in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Why that warning in the position in which it is found? Well, because of what precedes it. And what precedes it, of course, is a reference to the dramatic work in the earth of the three unclean spirits like frogs, the spirits of the French Revolution. Now, he calls them in, ch in chapter 16, verse 14, the spirits of devils. A spirit, of course, is an ideology or a way of thinking. And, of course, there's a lot of different ways of thinking around the earth today, but they do all have at least one common denominator. They're all bound to observe liberty, equality and fraternity. Devils is daemon or demons. It's used of the madness of legion, of insanity, of disease, of earthly wisdom in James chapter 3, verse 15, which James says produces confusion and every evil work, that's certainly true. These are the spirits of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. And what are they going to do? Well, look at verse 14. They're spirits of demons, or madness, working not miracles, although you probably think that miracles have been produced by them. The word means signs, working signs, which go forth out of the kings of the earth. So every single ruler upon earth is going to be affected by them. And we're watching rulers on earth today being shaken by them, aren't we? Even Colonel Gaddafi, you know, a dictator, is being shaken by these spirits of liberty, equality and fraternity. Mubarak's gone, and there'll be more, because you see, Christ says that this set of spirits, these three unclean ideologies, liberty, equality and fraternity, are going to lead the nations to Armageddon. He says that in verse 14. They go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole habitable, the oikimini. So there's not a person on earth, he says, that won't be affected by them. Rulers, common people, they're all going to be affected by these three spirits. And it says, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then verse 16 says, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And just between those two verses. 14 and 16, is this warning by our Lord Jesus Christ to you and me. Why would he put it there? Well, he's putting it there, sisters, because he knew. He knew just how serious the challenge to the truth would be at the end of the days because of liberty, equality and fraternity. And sadly, our community has fallen victim to it, at least in part. And I'm going to show you some evidence of that here this, uh, here this morning. We have fallen victim to it. And the forces that have been shaping society, which are going to bring this world to Armageddon, 
came from the philosophers of the 17th century, men like Spinoza, Voltaire, Rousseau, and others. And they produced a whole range of things from non-conformism, the French humanist philosophies, the atheist philosophy. It produced socialism through Karl Marx and company. And it produced, of course, these spirits of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which have gone throughout the whole world, affected every leader, every nation, every person on earth. How do I know that? I can see what's happened in my own life and it's happening in my family. And it grieves me at my heart that we haven't seen this coming as we ought to have seen it coming because the Lord's warning was there that it would happen and that our lives would be in jeopardy. Why else would he say, Blessed is he that keepeth his garments. What is he saying? You get caught up by these spirits. The garment that you have via baptism may well be taken from you. That's his warning. It's serious. It's a life and death matter. Now, sisters, all this has come about in this particular field of the role of women because of the women's liberation movement. What gave that birth? Liberty. Equality. Fraternity, the spirits of the French Revolution. And in 1975, of course, they had the International Women's Year. It was a, a watershed event in our world. And since then, women all around the world have sought and largely gained government-sponsored affirmative action programs. I used to be a human resources manager, so I know how this worked. You had to give preference under law to the female. That's how it worked the right to have their own career unhindered by family commitments, equality with men in the workplace, EEO, which of course is a way of saying equal employment opportunity, equal pay and promotional opportunities, government and employer subsidised childcare facilities, sometimes on site, equality in the church, even to the priesthood and ministry, and the number of churches that I've passed in the last six or 7,000 miles of this trip that I have seen women pastors or bishops is incredible. Here in America, it's incredible. But it's happened. And some of the consequences of this, disappearance of traditional family life, rapidly increasing rate of divorce and remarriage, the scourge of modern society, a growing number of de facto marriages, because more convenient to hop in and hop out, emergence of step families through remarriage, 35% of children who attend school in Australia have one parent in the home is not their natural father or mother. 35%. Dramatic growth of dining out for evening meals because of course women go out to work and uh, they're not in a position, neither is their husband, to cook a meal. So restaurants have prospered. So that's been one of the, well, that's just a few of the many outcomes of course of the women's liberation movement and men forced to accept domestic duties. Now this is our contemporary society. Recently, in late 2010, an entire Anglican parish in Britain returned to the Roman Catholic Church over the issue of the ordination of women bishops. They'd had enough. You know, you've heard of the debate that's been going on in the, in the uh, Anglican Church. It's called different things over here, the Episcopalians and people like that. This debate's been going on for a long, long time, and this group had, had had enough. So they just shifted en masse to the Catholic Church. The Pope is delighted because he's holding the line on this matter. The Catholic Church has accepted married priests, though, from other communions into its mainly celibate priesthood. That's a very convenient way of bringing them on board. And, of course, it's happening in our community, as you're going to see. You know, there was a time in 1968 when our beloved brother Maurice Stewart was visiting Australia almost every year. It was for that particular year that he made this statement that I can recall. He says, the Brotherhood is only five to ten years behind the trends in the world. He was right then. He's certainly right today. We're not that far behind. And, for once, Australia is in front of America. Because in Australia we have at least one ecclesia, which happens to be about two miles from where I live, so I know all about it, that has a sister as a recorder, <coughs> fellowships people from the Baptist Church, down the road. That gives you a bit of an idea where they're at. Sisters, 
are invited, of course, in our community in various places and at various conferences and gatherings to perform speaking roles that were once entirely reserved for the brethren. The Sisters Speak movement is gaining considerable momentum around the world. When I was here in 2009 visiting ecclesias in North America, I was being told almost every place that I went that I had been preceded by a prominent member, a sister, of the Women's Speak movement from Australia who was going around pushing that particular wheelbarrow. I happen to know that sister very well. Marg and I were very close to her parents. We actually used to go to their place frequently. We went on holidays together, so I know her very well. It's a great tragedy. Ecclesia in Adelaide, that doesn't want to be called an ecclesia, exists solely for the purpose of giving sisters equal authority in the meeting. And the ecclesia that's at the head of that list, the one up here in Brisbane, when we asked for a meeting with them, they sent four representatives of their ecclesia, two brethren and two sisters. So you just, just get a feel for what's happening in Australia. Now I say these things because I want one to warn you that though it may not, not be like that now, here, if time goes on, it will be like that. So you need to be warned of what's happening in our country because this movement is gaining great momentum and they're using, of course, technology so that Facebook and the internet generally and emails are now the vehicle for pumping this kind of ideology around our brotherhood. And they, they use certain arguments. In fact, this particular movement has recently sent a copy of this book, All One in Christ Jesus, to many ecclesias around the world. Complimentary copy of the book. And of course they obviously by using that title, All One in Christ Jesus, are not using it the way that Paul used it. They're using it to suggest that there should be no difference between the role of brethren and sisters in our meetings. That there should be equality across the board. That sisters should have equal rights to do whatever brethren do in the meeting, which of course is exactly where the Christadelphian churches stand. You'll notice I use that because that's the word they want you to use concerning them. The Christadelphian churches that have been established for this purpose. That's what they want to accomplish. Women of the church say that Paul, an unmarried man, was prejudiced against women, hence his biased teachings. Some Christadelphians say Paul's comments are site specific. <coughs> so that when Paul wrote to the Corinthians for argument's sake, he was writing to one ecclesia to address a local issue that had no relevance to anybody else. That's their argument. Others say that Paul's teachings are not matched by those of Christ. In other words, Paul was pontificating on these matters. He had no authority from Christ to do so, particularly on this matter of woman's role because he wasn't a married man and he had a, a bit of a bias against women anyway. Well, I'm uh, waiting to see Paul's reaction when he hears about that at the judgment seat of Christ. This matter of equality with men, I want just to bring before you some words from Brother Thomas. We hear much, he says, in some parts of the world of the political rights and equality of women with men and of their preaching and teaching in public assemblies. We need wonder at nothing which emanates from the unenlightened thinking of sinful flesh. Now this is written in 1848. He would go down like a lead balloon in certain quarters today. There is, he says, no absurdity too monstrous to be sanctified by unspiritualized animal intellect. Men do not think according to God's thinking and therefore it is they run into most, the most unscriptural conceits among which may be enumerated the political and social equality of women. So was John Thomas a woman hater. He was a married man. His wife made a lot of sacrifices for the truth. Many of you are familiar with his history. He spent months away from home preaching the truth. We might not be here today were it not for his labours and were it not for the sacrifice that his wife made in order that he might do that work. 
I don't think he was a woman hater. He was just a scriptural student. Trained to usefulness of cultivated intellect and with moral sentiments purified and ennobled by the nurture and admonition of the Lord's truth, women are helps meet for the Elohim and much too good for men of ordinary stand. I married one of them. She's much too good for me. No question about that. All right? So if you're fortunate as a, a brother to marry someone like that, whose mind is engaged in the truth, who loves God more than they love you, then you have got a gem. Not all that way though, is it? The sex, he says, is susceptible of this exhortation, though I despair of witnessing it in many instances till the age to come. But even women of this excellency of mind and disposition, were it possible for such to do so, would be guilty of indiscretion, presumption, and, he says, rebellion against God's law in assuming equality of rank, equality of rights, and authority over man, which is implied in teaching and preaching. It is, he says, the old ambition of the sex to be equal to the gods, but in taking steps to attain it, they involve themselves in subjection to men. Preaching, he says, and teaching or lecturing women are but species of actresses who exhibit upon the boards for the amusement of sinful and foolish men. And what's come into your mind when Brother Thomas speaks those words? Well, he anticipates it later on, as you'll see. He says, they aim at an equality for which they are not physically constituted. They degrade themselves by the exhibition. And in proportion, as they rise in assurance, they sink in all that really adorns a woman. Now, when God made the woman, sisters, he made, as Brother Thomas says, the finest of all his creation. The finest thing of all his creation was taken from the side of Adam. It was beautiful in every way. And yet today women in the world don't see that. And sadly some of our own don't see that the role that God prescribed for the woman by the very way she was created brings to her the greatest blessing she can ever have. That's being forsaken. Now I want you to come, if you would, to the 1st of Corinthians chapter 14. Because I want to just address some of these issues about Paul. Is, is Paul biased towards women? Is Paul not teaching that which Christ would endorse? In other words, just putting his own point of view. And is Paul just being site-specific? <coughs> in addressing the issues that confronted the Corinthian Ecclesia so that these things don't really apply to you and me. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 37 and 38. He says this, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now we're going to go back a couple of verses in a moment and we're going to see what he says. And... He's saying that what I just said are commandments of the Lord. Now, I don't think any of us would like to rebel against the commandments of the Lord. But he says, it's likely to happen. Why is it going to happen? Verse 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And I'll tell you what the greatest danger for our community in the last days is, sisters. Ignorance. That's the problem. Ignorance. And most of our difficulties arise from that. Lack of understanding. Because of there is a failure of, for, for, of people digging into the Bible. Growing in understanding and knowledge. And the Apostle Paul says that's where it's going to come from. Ignorance. Now you can go back to 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10. And you can get a similar idea. Just quickly flick back if you wouldn't mind. Chapter 7, verse 10, he says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So Paul is teaching, he's extrapolating on matters, because he's been asked a question about marriage, marriage to unbelievers as well. So he's answering those questions. 
He says, I am teaching you things that are based upon the teachings of Christ and of God. But then in verses 6 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 7, he says this, verse 6, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And verse 25, Now concerning virgins, that, that is those who have never been married, I have no commandment of the Lord. So yes, Paul now is extrapolating on the basis of divine principles and he's giving counsel which he can't directly relate to any specific commandment of God or Christ but it's consistent with those commandments. Now, very few of us would argue that Paul didn't understand the commandments of God and Christ or the way in which you could extrapolate them. Of all people, he had probably a head start on anybody else in that regard. He was instructed for three years in the wilderness for that purpose. Now, those things are questioned. His authority is questioned. The principle involved here is very clear. It's the principle of Luke chapter 10 and verse 16. And this is what Christ says in that passage. In Luke 10 and verse 16 we read, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. He's talking to his apostles. He that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. So Christ is saying, look, I'm teaching what I got from my Father. You apostles of mine are being sent forth to teach what I have taught you. And that's what Paul's doing. And he says, look, if they despise you and reject your teaching, which you got from me, then they despise me. They're not just despising me, they're despising my God. Because that's where I got it from, see? So it's very important that we don't get caught up in this foolishness. And this book that I just waved at you, sisters, is full of it, full of foolishness. It, it's designed to sweep away every Bible quote about the position of sisters and women. Every one of them. Sweep it away as though they never existed. That's how liberty, equality and fraternity works. You know, it works in the moral field this way, doesn't it? Is, does any, would anybody here, I mean, I know this is, there's an obvious answer to this, would anybody here give an inch to the immorality of homosexuality? Would you? Of course you wouldn't. But your children, if they happen to be going to public school, are being taught that there's nothing wrong with homosexuals. That's the way they were born. And what the society is doing is sweeping away the divine principles as though they never existed which of course is what the serpent did to Eve didn't he hath God said yes God has said have you thought about it this way <coughs> eat that tree and that tree oh I hadn't thought about it blinded and the divine law is swept away and forgotten and Eve was utterly <coughs> deceived and Paul says to the Corinthians in his second letter at chapter 11 he says I am worried about you brethren lest as the serpent beguiled Eve you might be beguiled by those in your meeting who are undermining fundamental divine principles so the warning is pretty obvious isn't it now Paul's teachings on women are for all ecclesias and for every era so come back to 1 Corinthians 14 if you would and just have a look at what he says in verses 33 to 34. For God is not the author of confusion, verse 33, but of peace, as in all ecclesias of the saints. So the one thing we know about God is that he aims for peace and unity. It's the unclean spirits that bring about dislocation, disunity, and confusion. They're the ones that James talks about. They produce confusion and every evil work. God is aiming for the opposite. We read in verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the ecclesias, he says, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. And he's talking about public speaking. He's not talking about teaching in the sense that sisters have a role. They teach in the home. They teach at Sunday school. He's talking about taking a position of authority over brethren. 
That's where the line is drawn. It's not permitted unto them, he says, to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now we'll come back to that phrase, and we're going to use Brother Thomas's exposition of it shortly. As also saith the law. Of course, the obvious answer is, what law? Paul doesn't tell you what law. What law? Well, we need to find out. And so he goes on to talk about where they should learn, he says. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands or their men folk, as the word is. You may not have a husband. And let them ask their men folk, in the Greek, at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the ecclesia. Now Paul uses the Old Testament as the primary source of his authority in these things. We just saw that in verse 34. And if you just like to quickly flick over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, another well-known passage in this regard, we're going to have a comment by Brother Thomas on both of these areas. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, he says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, which of course is supportive of what he's just said to the Corinthians. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And then he gives two reasons. There's a pre-fall reason and a post-fall reason for the subjection of the woman. The pre-fall is verse 13. For Adam, he says, was first formed, then Eve. In other words, the very way that God went about to bring the woman into existence itself taught the need for subjection. She was taken out of man. Woman is Isha. Man, Genesis 2.24, is Ish. She's taken out of the Ish. So he's Ish, she's Isha. The very way that God set out to create the woman, beautiful as it was as a type, marvellous as it was in a mechanism to create a sympathy between the two, bringing all of the benefits that only human beings can appreciate. Animals don't have a relationship that a man and a woman can have. Bringing all of those benefits, the very way that he did that was about subjecting the woman. That's the first reason. But of course we know that he says in a moment, in verse 14, that Eve messed things up. She was the first to do so. Verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now some texts have for that second word deceived a prefix added to the Greek word. Ek, kapateo. It means to deceive wholly, to delude thoroughly. And that was the case, sadly. That Eve, when she heard the serpent reasoning, was utterly deceived by it. The divine law which she had rightly upheld, we'll come back to that shortly, was swept aside. The curtain was pulled across. Not so with Adam. And that's why he's blamed for the introduction of sin into the world. Not Eve. She's the first to transgress, but God does not blame her for the introduction of sin into the world, nor its consequence, death. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we read, sisters, for by one man sin entered the world. Greek, masculine, singular. Who's he talking about? Next verse, Adam. By one man sin entered the world. Because when Adam came on that scene and his wife had eaten of that fruit, whatever she may have done to tempt him, and there was, as Brother Thomas says, clearly suggestions about that. Whatever she did, when Adam decided to go her way, he had a clear choice and he could see it. His choice was between God and his wife. And sadly, he was the first of many. The number of times that I've seen brethren confronted with a choice between God and a woman. Nearly always the woman wins. And that's why God says, I one man seen into the world. He was utterly deceived. Now there's the second reason, verse 14. It's post-fall. So there's a pre-fall reason in verse 13. There's a post-fall reason for her subjection in verse 14. 
Now, the reason we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 7, is that this sets forth the divine hierarchy. Now, I use that title not because I'm terribly impressed with it, but because in this book they spend a whole chapter trying to sweep it away. Divine hierarchy. There is such a thing as a divine hierarchy or order. I would prefer to use the word order. Order of authority. And that is set out by the Apostle Paul here in verses 3 to 5. He says this, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So here's our order. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. Okay? Now you'll notice that I have the words head in blue. This word head, this word head, and that one. This one here, and that one there. Those words head refer to an individual. Alright? To a being. Whereas these two in green refer to the literal head. This thing, the cranium. Okay? And what Paul is saying is pretty simple. He says, every man praying or prophesying having his head covered. Now, many of you will have been to many picnics in the summertime. We have them all around. I'm just rubbing this in. We have them all year round in Australia, especially in Queensland. And when it comes time to give thanks for the lunch, what do you see the brethren do? Automatically take off their hat. If you're like me, you have to have a hat in our summer because you get sunburned. They take off the hat. Why? Well, because of this. This this scripture, every man praying or prophesying, having his his head, his literal head, covered, dishonoreth his head. Does he dishonor this thing? No. He dishonors his head. The head of every man is Christ. So he dishonours this head. That's why we are sensitive about that. And if I'm giving the prayer or if I'm organising something, I say, brethren, young men, hats off, please. Before we pray, we do not want to dishonour our head, Christ, in any way. Then he says this, but every woman that prayed or prophesied, he's talking here about the ecclesial meetings, by the way, because that's the context of 1 Corinthians 11, as we know from the next passage. But every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Does he mean this head? No. He means this one, the man. The head of the woman is the man. So in the same way that the man, praying with his head covered, dishonors Christ, the woman praying in a public situation dishonours her head, the man. That's what he's saying. Now, are we right on this? Well, let's just read on. Verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much he is the, as it, he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. You notice he doesn't say that the woman is the image of and glory of the man. Because the last time I looked, the woman's body shape was different from what I see in the mirror. It's true, isn't it? She is the finest of God's creative works. Beautiful. That's why men fall head over heels for them. See? Beautiful. So she's not in the same shape as the man. So where's he getting this language from, do you think? Where is Paul deriving this language from? Well, it's from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. When the angel said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now the image has respect to shape. So the man was created in the shape of the angels. Presumably there are no female angels. So your shape as a woman is unique in the history of the universe, one would assume. Because the the man Adam was made in the shape of the angels, who are in the shape of God. 
Okay? The physical shape of God. So he doesn't use the word image of the woman here. He says, but the woman is the glory of the man. So what does he mean by glory? Well, in both instances, he's referring to the likeness of Genesis 1.26. And the likeness, of course, had to do with mental and moral capacity. And man and woman have equal mental and moral capacity. Now, people will argue about that, but I know some women who are more intelligent than many men, most men. Okay, so it's not a question of being lower in mentality or the intellectual abilities. That's not in question. Because both the man and the woman were given the likeness of the Elohim. In other words, the ability of God to think, to, to have thoughts about moral things, to have sentiments, which of course the animal kingdom doesn't have. So when he talks about glory, he's talking about the ability to think and act like God. Man and woman are equal in that field. And they are called upon, both of them, to manifest the character and the glory of God in their lives. But there is a divine order. And it's set out there by the Apostle Paul very, very plainly. And he says then in verse 9, uh, sorry, verse 10, by the way, we'll just read verse 8 through 10. He says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. She's Isha. He's Ish. She's Isha. She's out of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. Now this word power is the word exousia. Exousia has the idea of delegation of authority or authority. So she's got to put a sign of authority on her head that she understands. Understands what? He says, because of the angels. That is because of what they did when they brought her forth from the side of the man. They were establishing, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, some very simple but very important principles. The fact that she was taken out of the man the fact that she was created second means that she would be subject to him. And then, of course, when they sinned, the angels came back on the scene, didn't they? And they walked in the garden and said, well, where are they hiding? Why are you hiding? And we know the rest. It's history. Because she had not taken this matter to Adam, it becomes basis, the basis of her judgment. Because you didn't take this matter to Adam. You were taught by the order of your creation that you should take the matter to your husband you didn't do that and so she's judged on that basis so you see now she's further subjected to Adam for that reason and who's doing this subjection who's speaking the words of God here well the angels they're in the garden so on two occasions the angels have been involved in subjecting the woman to the man. So the woman puts a sign on her head, a mark on her head, to acknowledge what the angels did back in the garden on two occasions. That's Paul's exposition of what happened back in Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. Now this word dishonoreth her head is the word kata iskuna. Kata has a prefix, means down. It's a preposition meaning down. And literally it means to shame down, to bring disgrace. So she dishonours or shames down her head, the man, in public, says the Apostle Paul. Now, what about this matter back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as also saith the law? Brother Thomas says this, the law which forms a part of the foundation of the world says to the woman, he shall reign over thee. The nature of this subjection is well exhibited in the Mosaic law. Numbers 30, chapter 30, verses 3 to 15. He goes on to say this, A daughter, being yet in her youth, in her father's house, could only make a vow subject to his will. If he held his peace and said nothing for or against 
She was bound by her word. But if when he heard it, he disallowed it, she was not bound to perform. And the Lord forgave the failure of the vow. The same law applied to a wife. Now just pause there for a sec. We don't even need to go back to Numbers 30, but could I just suggest perhaps writing Numbers 30 alongside of verse 34 of 1 Corinthians 14 might be a useful way of knowing what law he's talking about. Now most of you of course are quite familiar with Numbers 30. That if a man made a vow there was no way of escape. He couldn't go back to God tomorrow and say now listen uh, God I, I got this wrong um, uh, you know I, I really shouldn't have made this vow. Too bad. Finito. Fulfill it or else. But what about the woman? What about his wife or his daughter? If he, the husband and the, fa and the father, heard that vow, he could disallow it. He could say, no dear, I don't think you can keep that or I, I don't think that's a wise thing to do. And God would say, well, I never heard the vow. It's cancelled. It's finished. So for wife and daughter, the man of the house could overrule them. And God would forget that the vow was ever made. Now think about that. Think about the implications of that. He goes on to say, A widow or divorced woman were both bound to fulfil unless their husbands had made them void before separation. If not, being subject to God, they had no release. This throws light upon the apostles' instructions concerning women. They are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. The reason he gives for imposing silence and subjection is remarkable. He adduces the priority of Adam's formation, and the unhappy consequences of Eve's talkativeness and leadership in transgression. As it is written, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2, which we just looked at. And then, as to their public ministrations, he says, let women keep silence in the congregations, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but to be under obedience as saith the law. Now all that's pretty clear, isn't it? Very clear. Now I want to add a few words from Brother Thomas and then uh, I'm going to seek some uh, approval to spend another five or ten minutes because I want to actually take you back to Judges chapter 4 and to look at one of the principal characters that the Women Speak movement use as the leading chariot in their campaign, the woman Deborah. Brother Thomas says this, about exercising the gift of teaching. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame, he's quoting Corinthians, for women to speak in the congregation. It is true, he says, that in another place the apostle says, let the aged women be teachers of good things. But then this teaching is not to be in the congregation or in the brazen attitude of a public oratrix. They are to exercise their gift of teaching privately among their own sex, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God, which they profess, be not blasphemed. Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Christian women, he says, should not copy after the God aspiring Eve, but after Sarah, the faithful mother of Israel, who submitted herself in all things to Abraham, calling him Lord, even when he was, at that time, a failure as a husband and a leader, and did not give honour unto the weaker vessel, allowing her to go into the house of Pharaoh, into the high reem of Abimelech, through telling lies, untruths, which Christadelphians should not do. That's another story. He goes on to say this, about the example of Sarah. Nor should their obedience be restricted to Christian husbands only. They should also obey them without the word, that is, those who have not submitted to it, in order that they may be won over to the faith when they behold the chaste and respectful behaviour of their wives, 
produced by a belief of the truth. And so believing wives who have an unbelieving husband should still, he says, apply this principle of subjection to their husband. 1 Peter 3, clear about that. Now, sisters, we're living at the end of the days. You know as well as I do that in Luke chapter 17 and at verse 33, 34, the Lord Jesus Christ warned. He says, remember Lot's wife. And we know what her primary problem was. It was materialism. But I don't think there's any doubt that Lot's wife had been infected by the age, the times in which she lived. And she may well have some compatriots at the judgment seat. So we need to be very careful that we don't fall into the trap of Lot's wife. And when you look at these two women, Sarah and Lot's wife, the contrast is dramatic. So here is contrasting Christadelphian homes. We've got Sarah who was content to dwell in tents, while Lot's wife, of course, loved the materialism of Sodom. We have Sarah who laboured with Abraham to show hospitality. We have Lot's wife who's invisible. You know, when the angels come, she's invisible. Though present. And it's Lot who has to go and provide. But when you read Genesis 18, both Abraham and Sarah readied the meal for the three angels. So husband and wife are working together. In Lot's house, he's the one that prepares the meal. Think about that, the implications of that for the times in which we live. Sarah faithfully followed Abraham with a Sir, with a Sir Hebert. He went, reluctantly though, Lot's wife left Sodom under angelic compulsion. The angels grabbed her hand and said, you're coming with us. And then she looked back. Sarah called Abraham Lord in her heart. Lot's wife left her heart in Sodom and turned back from behind her husband. She was dragging behind. He couldn't help when she's behind. Sarah trusted God when forsaken by her husband in the matter of the harem of Pharaoh and of Abimelech. Lot's wife trusted in uncertain riches when she was with her husband. Sarah was subject to her husband even when he failed to honor the weaker vessel. Lot's wife was independent when Lot's presence was vital to her survival. Sarah had prayers poured out before God that were heard by him. Lot's wife appears to have been prayerless in the hour of need and she was forsaken. Sarah is called the well from whence we are digged. Isaiah chapter 51 verses 1 and 2. Lot's wife becomes a solitary and sterile pillar of salt. The contrast is so marked, isn't it? Just so marked. Let's not fall into that trap. Now come back with me to Judges chapter 4. I guess I've got permission. I didn't see too many heads shaking that way. A few minutes, a few minutes before we retire and have whatever it is we're having, lunch or whatever. Um, come back to Judges chapter 4. You know, this is one of these chapters that is now being debated around our brotherhood. Debated because this is a principal plank on which the Women Speak movement will base their thrust that women can take prominent leadership teaching roles in the Brotherhood. Because it's happened in history. See? So if Deborah could do it, why can't we do it? That's their basic argument. Well, they have no idea of what Judges 4 is about. And it's ignorance. It's ignorance that leads to these kinds of conclusions. I don't want you to be in any way influenced by these ignorant interpretations of Judges chapter 4. Why is Deborah a leader in Israel at this time of their history? You have to answer that question. And the question is answered because of why Judges 4 is there at all. Why do you want to know about this story? Because it's history? You think God puts this story there because it's history? Of course not. It's there because it's a type. You know, it's one of the fascinating things about the book of Judges is that every judge where you get a full story is a type of Christ. In the case of Abimelech, the son of Gideon, remember him in Judges 9, and I guess when you read Judges 9 you wonder why it's such a long, seemingly innocuous, worthless record. Forget it. 
Abimelech is a type of the Antichrist. He's a type of the papacy. And Judges 9 is about the development of the Roman Catholic apostasy out of the Ecclesia, about its entire history and its destruction. So that's why you've got a full record. That's why you've got 58 verses in Judges 9. Now, how many of you would be interested to know what Shamgar did in Judges chapter 3? He does Samson-like feats. He kills 600 men with an ox goat. Try killing one man with an ox goat. 600 men with an ox goat. Wouldn't you like to know about that? I'd love to know what Shamgar did. You know how many verses God gives you about Shamgar? One. One verse. Why? Because Shamgar is not a type of Christ. That's why. So when you read the story of Othniel and of Ehud and of Deborah and Barak and of Gideon and of Abimelech and Samson and Jephthah, you can see the whole work of Christ, first and second advent. And I mean that, sisters. I could stand here, if you gave me enough time, we could cut the rest of the books out of our Bible and just leave one. And I will teach you every single, and I mean it, every single aspect of the work of Christ, first and second advent, and the history of the Catholic Church and its destruction from judges. So that's why we've got this book. Not because God wants you to read history, because he wants you to know something about his son and the way he would redeem mankind through him. That's why it's there. So when you come to Judges 4, read it that way. And it comes alive. There are four primary characters here. There's not just four, there's six all up. But there's four primary characters here. And the first of them is Jabin, king of Canaan. We meet him in verse 2. Yahweh sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. Most of you will be aware of what Canaan means, of course. His name means intelligent or wise, which just happens to be the primary characteristic of the serpent. Genesis 3 verse 1, who was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh made. Now Jabin is a dynastic name like Pharaoh, and there were two who ruled from Hatzor, which means a village, in northern Israel, Galilee. Joshua chapter 11 verse 1 is the record of the other Jabin. And in both cases, Jabin is a type of the serpent. No question about that. If we had time to do that, we could show you, I could sit you down and we could go through Joshua chapter 11 and we could open, open up Revelation chapter 20 and guess what? The language of Revelation 20 is drawn directly from Joshua chapter 11. Joshua 11 is the type of the events of Revelation 20 the end of mortality, the final rebellion in the earth. Because Joshua 11 is the final conflict in the book of Joshua. And the final conflict on earth will be the conflict at the end of the millennium when a multitude rise up to try and overthrow the government of Christ and the saints. So that's why the language of Revelation 20 comes out of Joshua chapter 11. And of course we know what Revelation 20 is about, don't we? That old serpent who's finally destroyed. So Genesis 3.15 is finally fulfilled in the events of Revelation chapter 20. Now Canaan means humiliated. And in Philippians chapter 3 verse 21, Paul says that he is waiting for the return of Christ, that he might deliver us from this vile body, says the authorised version. Well, at times I think my body is vile, but it's a bad translation. It should be rendered, who shall deliver us from the body of our humiliation. And that's what my body is. I'm not quite sure about yours, but mine is a body of humiliation. It humiliates me, usually through sin and failure. I get humiliated by it. How about you? So Jabin the serpent is the monarch of humiliation. He represents the power of of sin, king sin, the serpent carnal reasoning that was there in the garden that deceived Eve. That's what he represents. So Judges 4 is an enacted parable of the overthrow of the serpent power by Christ. That's what it's about. 
It's about God setting forth the pattern of Genesis 3.15 in a typical way. Now, here's the language. Look, I'm not going to go through the sisters. It would take us too long. But here's the language of Joshua 11 laid over against Revelation 20. Verse 1, Jacob, intelligent. The old servant, more subtle. Genesis 3, verse 1. He gathers his confederacy, which, by the way, consists of 13 peoples and kings, and 13 is the number of rebellion. So he gathers this confederacy from north, south, east and west. Verse 8 of Revelation 20, they're gathered from the four quarters of the earth. What's that? North, south, east and west. Verse 4, there is a number of the sand upon the seashore. Revelation 20, verse 8, they're numerous like the sand on the seashore. Verse 5, they met together, they pitched together. Verse 9, they went up upon the breadth of the earth. Verse 5, they came against Israel at Meron. Meron means height or elevation. They come against the beloved city in Revelation 20. And we read in Psalm 48, verse 2, that Zion is beautiful for elevation. Beautiful for Meron. Height, elevation. Verse 6, they burn the chariots with fire, and fire comes down from God out of heaven in Revelation 20 and verse 9. They defeated at Mishrifoth Main, it says in Joshua chapter 11, verse 8, which means the burnings of waters. And in Revelation 20, verse 10, they're cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. When was the last time you saw a lake burning? A lake of water doesn't burn, but a lake of fire and brimstone does. Mishrifoth Main. He left none remaining. Verse 8, the second death. Mortality is abolished in Revelation 20. Verse 11, let none to breathe. That's an unusual phrase, isn't it? Why would you use this phrase? None to breathe. Well, what do you breathe? I know what I breathe. Oxygen. Because when Revelation 20 is fulfilled, no mortality will remain. Nobody's going to be breathing oxygen anymore. Revelation, uh, sorry, Joshua 11, 23, the land rested from war. In Revelation 20, the serpent's destroyed. There's no sin and death. And God can retire from the conflict that he triggered in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity, warfare, between your way of thinking, Mr. Serpent, and my way of thinking. So what symbol did God use for his way of thinking that would be at war with the serpent way of thinking, carnal thinking, that doesn't bring into account divine law? What symbol does he use? Man? No. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. Why the woman? Well because you see initially she upheld the divine law. Hath God said? Yes, God hath said. She went a step further sisters. She extrapolated. She said neither shall we touch it. God didn't say that. They had concluded that the very best thing to do about this tree of knowledge and good thing was to stay right away from it. Don't even touch it. So she upheld God's law. And then the servant said, what, what about this? Eat that tree, eat that tree. You get both. Best of both worlds. Oh, <coughs> divine law gone. But up to that point, she upheld the divine law. So when God comes to choose a symbol to represent his way of thinking in the eternal conquest until it's all over, with carnality and amorality, he chooses the woman. Got it? So there has to be a woman who leads Israel at this time of their history. It can't be a man. Because this is all about Genesis 3.15. Now Sisera is the seed of the serpent. His name means war like a ray. Jacob's captain, he represents the seed of the serpent in violent political manifestation against Israel. His chariots of iron, of course, type, they point to the type representing Rome's involvement in all of this because it was the Romans who crucified Christ. That's how Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled. So here we've got a type developing. I'm going to be very quick about this. Deborah the woman. Her name signifies a being from the root orderly motion, a noun of unity. She's a symbol for the divine wisdom in action, the mind of God. Her husband is Lapidoth, to shine as lightning. 
A divine light shines for all to see, says Christ in Luke 17. The palm tree means to be erect or upright. Okay, so they came up to Deborah, under the palm tree of Deborah. What for? To seek the divine mind. Where was it? Ramah, a height. That is, it's in heavenly places. Where? Near Bethel, the house of God, the ecclesia. Get the idea? Not one detail is out of place. Who, what about Barak? Well, he's a type of cross. His name signifies a glittering or a flashing sword. You only get a glitter from the sun on a sword when it's moving. And the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, the word of God is quick, it's alive, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It was seen in a man. And we know who this man Barak represents. He's the son of Abinoam, the father of graciousness. And he's revealed as a type of Christ. You can make a comparison between the words of the Song of Deborah and Judges 5 verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive. Swept up in Psalm 68 verse 18. Picked up by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 verse 8. Concerning Christ. Absolutely no doubt about who Barak represents in the scheme of things. And where was he when he was called by Deborah? Kadesh Naphtali means the sanctuary of my wrestling. Where's that? Not far from Nazareth. So you can go on and on. You have the development here of a wonderful type. But it's not Deborah who puts Sisera, the serpent's agent, to death, is it? Who is it? Another woman. Her name's Jael. I wonder why it has to be a woman. Well, the woman, sisters represents the divine element in the atonement. That's what she represents. The divine element in the atonement. And the woman's speak movement is seeking to destroy that. That's what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. So their theory about Deborah is based on pure, if you can have such a thing, pure ignorance. They have no idea what Judges 4 is about. But you and I do. So let's stick to it. Brother Roberts wrote this in the Law of Moses. That this was God's design. Create counterparts beautifully, harmoniously, that they might work together to raise a godly seed to magnify and glorify his name in the earth, being completely overturned by the world in which we live. Man is the strength, judgment and achievement. Woman is the grace, sympathy and ministration. Between them, they form a beautiful unit, heirs together the grace of life. Let me just ask you one final question. What does that mean? Heirs together of the grace of life. God changed Abram's name and Sarai's name in Genesis 17. Sarai's name means dominative. Dominative. It's changed to a princess, subject to a prince. When God changed Abraham's name, he added a letter, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet with a numerical value of five in the fifth position, increasing Abraham's numerical value from 243 to 248. And the name Abraham occurs in the Bible 248 times. And when he changed Sarai's name, he took a letter out. Didn't put one in. He took it out. He took the Hebrew letter with a numerical value of 10 out of her name and he put the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet with a numerical value of 5 into the fifth position of her name to replace it. Abraham's gone up by 5. She's gone down by 5. The net difference is 10 the number of ordinal perfection and God's saying 
When I changed their name, I was memorialising this simple fact, that though Abraham had let his wife down and had not honoured the weaker vessel, she called him Lord in her heart nevertheless and recognised her position of submission, and I'm memorialising it. He's gone up by five, she's gone down by five. Heirs, together, of the grace. Grace? Yeah. Five. Genesis 17. Fifth, fifth appearance by Yahweh to Abraham to make the fifth promise, which is all about grace for you and me. Let's not forget where we stand in the scheme of things. And let's work with our God to make sure that that produces the fruit for which he originally designed. I think I've said enough. So I'm going to turn some machines off here. Just press this red button, has it? It's on pause. Okay.